progress continues. The perseverance of humanity, launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the Red Planet. NASA's Mars Perseverance rover left Earth six months ago. Now we are gearing up for touchdown on the red planet in just a few weeks. The rover will attempt to land in Jezero Crater on February 18th. It's the most difficult landing site on Mars ever attempted, but the Perseverance rover and the team are ready. Welcome to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. I'm Raquel Villanueva. Today we are here to talk about Perseverance's mission. We will go over the challenges the team has faced and the challenging landing ahead. We will also talk about the mission science goals and how Perseverance fits into NASA's future plans for Mars sample return. On our panel today are NASA Associate Administrator Thomas Zerbukin, NASA Planetary Science Division Director Lori Glaze, Perseverance Deputy Project Manager Matt Wallace, Entry, Descent, and Landing Phase Lead, Al Chen, Perseverance Project Scientist, Ken Farley, Perseverance Science Team Member, Bryony Horgan. For anyone watching who'd like to submit a question, you can do so by using the Countdown to Mars hashtag. Our phone lines are now open to the media. You can ask a question by pressing star one. I'd like to start by welcoming Thomas Zerbukin. Hey, thanks so much. I'm so pleased to be here today as the Perseverance rover makes the final kilometers on its long journey to Mars and the landing on February 18th. I want to note for a moment the place where we find ourselves, a place where a mission to Mars and what all of us do in science and exploration provide hope and unity. Vice President Harris said, even in dark times, we not only dream, we do. We don't only see what has been, we see what can be. We shoot for the moon and then we plant our flag on it. We are bold, fearless and ambitious." End of quote. At the request of the new administration, a rock from the Apollo 17 mission was delivered to the White House on loan on display in the Oval Office a recognition of the bold, fearless ambitions and accomplishments of earlier generations, and the symbol of the new administration's support for America's current Moon to Mars exploration approach. And Perseverance is at the forefront of that work. As our cosmic neighbor and as a destination, Mars continues to captivate our imagination, both as scientists and as explorers. And it seems every time we learn something new, we uncover more questions. We know that Mars had a wet past, and we used our spirit and opportunity rovers to follow the water in search of answers as to why this once ocean world is now dry and desolate. Following those missions came our Curiosity rover, which landed on Mars in 2012 and is still operating today and constantly sending back data about the complex chemical composition and history of Mars. We have additional missions in development and formulation, but the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover is the next step in a logical progression that NASA has strategically pursued with Mars exploration, and it builds upon decades of knowledge, experience, and unique expertise. Perseverance is our robotic astrobiologist and it will be the first rover NASA has sent to Mars with the explicit goal of searching for signs of ancient Astrobiologist. life. It will, build it will be the, what we currently know from our previous rovers, orbiters, and landers, 
and it will attempt to answer an age-old question that has eluded humanities for generation, whether life has ever existed elsewhere beyond our own planet, our Earth. Perseverance also will help enable human exploration of the planet in the coming years as it demonstrates new and more precise entry, descent, and landing technologies. The MOXIE instrument will show us how to produce oxygen on the Martian surface from the atmosphere, and many other aspects of our science instruments will inform the future journey of astronauts there. Our rover also carries the Ingenuity helicopter, which will be the first aircraft to attempt controlled flight on another planet, a true extraterrestrial Wright Brothers moment. The rover exemplifies the spirit of exploration as it pulls on science, technology, and human exploration to work to advance our goals in many areas. And perseverance, by its very name, describes the human spirit that gets us there. Landing on Mars is hard enough, and while we are all eagerly awaiting the next, the, the day next month when Perseverance safely lands on the red planet, it is not guaranteed that we will be su successful. It's very hard. While we hope that the situation on our world with respect to COVID would have improved since launch, it has not. And that has meant that we've needed to be flexible and adapt to keep working safely and effectively. Regardless of everything that has happened due to COVID, it is the constant innovation, dedication, and above else, unity of this team that has allowed work on the Perseverance rover to continue in a safe manner. And now the world can join us once again as we attempt to do one of the hardest things ever done by humanity, and certainly in space science. Success does not come easily, and it's only due to the efforts of this team that we are here today to talk about this next step in Mars exploration and planetary science. You'll hear my colleagues on this panel talk about the difficulties of landing, the technologies that make it possible, and the hope a successful landing brings for finally bringing a sample of Mars home to Earth. But the journey of perseverance also begins with a successful touchdown. It only begins that way, in fact. Then the hard work and the long-term perseverance really starts. That's because Perseverance is also the first step in our round-trip mission to Mars. Our rover begins an ambitious international campaign with the European Space Agency to bring pristine samples from Mars safely back to Earth through our Mars Sample Return Campaign, which you'll hear my colleague, Dr. Lori Glaze, speak about in more detail. At NASA, we are dedicated to the peaceful exploration of space for the benefit of humanity and we are dedicated to inspiring the next generation of explorers. Science has the power to unite us as it transcends language, borders, and many boundaries of many types. This mission could not have a better name, Perseverance. And it is my sincere hope that this mission will inspire all of us, all of you, to persevere together in hopes of a better tomorrow. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Lori Glaze, Director of the Planetary Science Division, to tell you more about why we want a sample of Mars and how we'll get it done. Lori? Thank you, Thomas. I am thrilled to be here today as our countdown to Mars winds down from months to just weeks. Perseverance is closing in on the red planet and our team is preparing for her to touch down at Jezero Crater. After an incredibly challenging year filled with high stakes on a world stage of uncertainty, I am so proud of the men and women across all of NASA. Their focus, dedication, and resolve never once wavered. They are the epitome of perseverance, and they are the heart of perseverance. This epic mission that exemplifies NASA's vision for science to lead a globally interconnected program of discovery that encourages innovation, positively impacts people's lives, and is a source of inspiration. As the next bold step in our Mars exploration program, Perseverance is the most advanced mission humans have ever sent to the red planet's surface. To say we're pumped about it, well, that would be a huge understatement. One of Perseverance's primary objectives 
supports the field of astrobiology, which is the study of how life comes to be, the environments that can support life, and the search to see if life exists anywhere else beyond Earth. Perseverance is the very first rover designed to seek signs of past microbial life by collecting and caching rock and soil samples that will be returned to Earth by future missions. Her robust set of advanced instruments will also look for evidence of ancient habitable environments and monitor environmental conditions, all of which are paramount to increasing our understanding of how to protect future human explorers. Mars is a keeper of deep scientific secrets, which the rover will help unlock by studying the ancient record preserved in the layers of rock on the planet's surface. Scientists will be looking for rocks that may have formed in water, possibly preserving evidence of the chemical building blocks of life. For generations, scientists have wanted a sample of Mars to study. While we do have Martian meteorites here on Earth, it's much different than having samples of Mars rocks and soil that are pristine and that we know exactly where they came from. Samples from Mars have the potential to profoundly change our understanding of the origin, evolution, and distribution of life on Earth and elsewhere in the solar system. Even now, NASA continues to study moon samples returned by the Apollo program more than 50 years ago. We expect samples of Mars to provide new knowledge for decades to come as we study them with state-of-the-art laboratory tools we couldn't possibly carry to Mars right now. We may even see a sample of Mars displayed in the Oval Office one day. But first, we need to bring the samples back to Earth. The plans for Mars sample return are multifaceted and complex, but it's exciting how our technologies have matured, bringing us to this point where we can now attempt this amazing feat. To be certain we are ready, NASA initiated an independent review board to determine if this long-awaited mission is positioned for success. The board concluded that NASA is indeed prepared for the campaign, building on decades of scientific advancements and technical progress in Mars exploration. This historic endeavor demands multiple spacecraft and our partnership with the European Space Agency working together with a carefully orchestrated approach. Let me show you how. First, Perseverance will drill and prepare samples for return and cache them on the surface of Mars. In 2026, a fetch rover will be launched to collect those samples and bring them to a rocket that will launch them into orbit around Mars. Another orbiter will rendezvous and capture those samples for safe delivery to Earth. If it sounds complicated, it is. If it sounds extreme, it most certainly is. The Mars sample return mission will also help us prepare for human exploration. Things like the precision landing technology, capability to launch the first rocket from the Martian surface, and being able to assess soil characteristics and toxicity are all essential to paving the way for the health and safety of our human explorers. The technology to return the samples that Perseverance collects is maturing but NASA's investments in developing autonomous robots and landing large payloads on Mars have laid the groundwork for a successful sample return campaign. We are so thrilled to be working with ESA on Mars sample return and with partners from Spain, Norway, and France on perseverance science as we take our next steps in exploring the solar system. It's taken a lot of work and there is much more work to do. But if there's one thing the Perseverance engineers and scientists have proven is there's just no I in team. I'll throw things back over to JPL where Matt Wallace will talk about his team and give a project overview. Thank you very much, Lori. Uh, thank both you and, and Thomas for your kind words about the uh, team, first of all. I've worked on every Mars rover mission. This is my uh, fifth one. And uh, perseverance is different in many important ways. And I wanted to touch on some of those for you to start this off. First of all, this is the biggest vehicle we've ever attempted to land on Mars. It weighs in at over a metric ton, and it is carrying 50% more science and technology payload than uh, Curiosity, its closest relative, which landed in 2012. There are a number of new landing technologies on this vehicle, which uh, Al Chen, my teammate here, will talk about shortly. 
But these technologies have been critical in allowing us to send this vehicle in the Jezero Crater, a scientifically important location, but also a difficult place to land on Mars, and a site that was considered on previous missions but rejected. We can now get there with our technologies. We're carrying really an exquisitely complex and sophisticated set of new instruments to the surface of Mars for the first time. Uh, these are the instruments which our project scientist, Ken Farley, will tell you more about, but they're gonna allow us to do the best job we can to understand that environment we land on and to pick the best samples, very limited number of samples that can come back on that uh, Mars sample return mission, which Lori and Thomas talked about. We've also built uh, probably the most complex, complex mechanized system that we've ever done in the Mars program, and that's, that's probably saying something because we've, we've taken on some big challenges before. But our sampling and caching system is uh, the, the, the hardware that we'll use to collect those samples. Uh, it's also extremely clean to ensure that we don't have any terrestrial contamination riding along with us when we collect those samples and we bring them back to the Earth. We've added a lot of surface autonomy, uh, a lot of new AI, if you will, uh, to this vehicle so that we can complete this mission on the surface. All of our Mars rovers are kind of self-driving cars to some degree. <laughs> but Perseverance is gonna drive three times faster uh, than any previous Mars rover so that it can get that job done that we talked about uh, in an expeditious and efficient fashion on the surface. Finally, Perseverance is really leaning forward uh, in my mind more than any of these other vehicles which we've sent to Mars. You know, in the 1960s, right here at this facility at JPL, in fact, in the same clean room uh, that we're, where we assembled and tested Perseverance, which you just saw in that clip, uh, we built missions called Ranger and Surveyor. They were the precursor missions to the moon. They were human precursor missions for the Apollo astronauts. And in many ways, uh, uh, Perseverance serves that purpose for Mars. Uh, as I mentioned, we're carrying a lot of new landing technology, which will feed forward into that activity. We have more surface intelligence, again, more autonomy. That's a feed forward technology as well. Uh, we're carrying a suite of ruggedized commercial high definition video cameras. We're gonna be able to watch ourselves for the first time land on another planet. We're carrying microphones to the surface of Mars. This will be the first time we've been able to put that human sensory capability on the surface and, and, uh, and see what we get. All those are very exciting. We have a weather station, which will tell us a lot about the dust and the radiation and the weather environment that astronauts would need to understand and survive uh, for, future, for future human exploration as well. And so uh, this is a mission that's uh, certainly leaning forward. And I, I wanna show you one of those technology experiments if you wanna run the clip this is uh, a uh, picture of the MOXIE experiment getting integrated into the rover. The rover's upside down, and as you can see, the MOXIE uh, experiment is getting craned into the belly of the vehicle. Now, what is MOXIE? MOXIE is something called uh, an in-situ resource utilization experiment, which is kind of a fancy way of saying living off the land. This is an experiment that will actually create oxygen on the surface of Mars by ingesting the Martian atmosphere, the carbon dioxide, dissociating it using a process called electrolysis and creating pure oxygen. Now, this is a scaled experiment to demonstrate this technology for future human exploration, both uh, obviously for life support purposes but the oxygen is also important as an oxidizer for fuel to bring those human missions back to the Earth. Uh, and so all of that is really an exciting and new aspect uh, to the mission. Uh, now, uh, none of these uh, things really happen 
Uh, and one more clip, please, on the next clip. I want to take you through uh, one of our stars, actually, here, before I go to the next piece here. This is the Ingenuity helicopter. Thank you. As most of you know, uh, Ingenuity is being carried on the belly of the vehicle. We'll find a good place to deploy it on the surface of Mars. We'll drive off to a standoff distance, and then we will become the official photographer for Ingenuity as it attempts to do something that's never been done before, which is powered flight on another planet. You know, this is a technology that's really going to open up a new exploration modality for us, very much like uh, the rovers did 20 years ago when we flew Sojourner on a first mission to Mars. So none of these things uh, actually happen um, without a, a lot of help. And uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge the many industry partners that we've had along the way. There are over a thousand suppliers uh, that have provided hardware for this mission. Uh, they're located in over 500 different cities, 44 different states. Pretty much every NASA center has contributed in one fashion or another to this mission. And in fact, internationally, we have um, educational uh, facilities and universities, uh, as well as additional suppliers that provide both engineering and science hardware for this mission. So this is, this is certainly a, a team effort. And every, every mission inquires, uh, um, deals with challenges at one point or another. And frankly, after having been doing this for three decades or so, I thought I had seen just about everything until about a year ago when I was proven wrong and, uh, and we all had to face uh, the global pandemic. Uh, now this is something that happened right during the final processing for the spacecraft down at Kennedy Space Center. Um, we had to react quickly. The teams uh, had to figure out how to both keep uh, the, the teams and their families safe as well as continue to make progress for the launch, as Thomas indicated. Uh, it was really the first time during the entire development where I felt that the launch was in uh, actually some jeopardy. It was just so comprehensive and, and so, so new. And so many teams came together to help us across the agency. Other NASA centers helped get us uh, hardware and, and people down to the to Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the headquarters team stepped in, both Lori and Thomas specifically and others, to help us get through that period. And of course, the team rose to the challenge uh, and got us and got us to the launch pad. And we've managed to fly the spacecraft uh, to a point here where we're just a few weeks away now from from landing. I asked the team in the spring of last year uh, to come up with uh, something that would symbolize to mark this, this challenge and to thank, in particular, the frontline workers, uh, the medical community that were out there doing their job. And the team designed this, uh, we call it our COVID plate, as you can see. Uh, it's got a representation of the Earth, the globe, uh, all of us facing this challenge together. Uh, it's got a symbol of the spacecraft leaving the Earth, heading to Mars, and of course, all of this supported by the familiar staff and serpent of the medical community. We're proudly carrying this plate to Mars so that we'll remember back here on the Earth in the year 2020 and 21, uh, that there was a community that stepped up and bravely did their jobs so that we could do ours. I want to uh, pass the baton at this point uh, over to Al Chen. He is our entry, descent, and landing lead. Uh, Ranger and surveyor. They were the precursor missions to the moon. They were human precursor missions for the Apollo astronauts. And in many ways, uh, uh, Perseverance serves that purpose for Mars. Uh, as I mentioned, we're carrying a lot of new landing technology, which will feed forward into that activity. We have more surface intelligence, again, more autonomy. That's a feed forward technology as well. Uh, we're carrying a suite of ruggedized commercial high definition video cameras. We're gonna be able to watch ourselves for the first time land on another planet 
We're carrying microphones to the surface of Mars. This will be the first time we've been able to put that human sensory capability on the surface and, and, uh, and see what we get. All those are very exciting. We have a weather station, which will tell us a lot about the dust and the radiation and the weather environment that astronauts would need to understand and survive uh, for, future, for future human exploration as well. And so uh, this is a mission that's uh, certainly leaning forward. And I, I want to show you one of those technology experiments if you want to run the clip. This is uh, a uh, picture of the MOXIE experiment getting integrated into the rover. The rover's upside down. And as you can see, the MOXIE uh, experiment is getting craned into the belly of the vehicle. Now, what is MOXIE? MOXIE is something called uh, an in situ resource utilization experiment, which is kind of a fancy way of saying living off the land. This is an experiment that will actually create oxygen on the surface of Mars by ingesting the Martian atmosphere, the carbon dioxide, dissociating it using a process called electrolysis and creating pure oxygen. Now, this is a scaled experiment to demonstrate this technology for future human exploration, both uh, obviously for life support purposes, but the oxygen is also important as an oxidizer for fuel to bring those human missions back to the Earth. Uh, and so all of that is really an exciting and new aspect uh, to the mission. Uh, now, uh, none of these uh, things really happen. Uh, and one more clip, please, on the next clip. I want to take you through uh, one of our stars, actually, here, before I go to the next piece here. This is the Ingenuity helicopter. Thank you. As most of you know, uh, Ingenuity is being carried on the belly of the vehicle. We'll find a good place to deploy it on the surface of Mars. We'll drive off to a standoff distance, and then we will become the official photographer for Ingenuity as it attempts to do something that's never been done before, which is powered flight on another planet. You know, this is a technology that's really gonna open up a new exploration modality for us very much like uh, the rovers did 20 years ago when we flew Sojourner on the first mission to Mars. So none of these things uh, actually happen um, without a, a lot of help. And uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge the many industry partners that we've had along the way. There are over a thousand suppliers uh, that have provided hardware for this mission. Uh, they're located in over 500 different cities, 44 different states. Pretty much every NASA center has contributed in one fashion or another to this mission. And in fact, internationally, we have um, educational uh, facilities and universities, uh, as well as additional suppliers that provide both engineering and science hardware for this mission. So this is, this is certainly a, a team effort. And every, every mission inquires, uh, um, deals with challenges at one point or another. And frankly, after having been doing this for three decades or so, I thought I had seen just about everything until about a year ago when I was proven wrong. And, uh, and we all had to face uh, the global pandemic. Uh, now, this is something that happened right during the final processing for the spacecraft down at Kennedy Space Center, um, we had to react quickly. The teams uh, had to figure out how to both keep uh, the, the teams and their families safe, as well as continue to make progress for the launch, as Thomas indicated. Uh, it was really the first time during the entire development where I felt that the launch was in uh, actually some jeopardy. It was just so comprehensive and, and so, so new. And so many teams came together to help us across the agency. Other NASA centers helped get us uh, hardware and, and people down to the to Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the headquarters team stepped in, both Lori and Thomas specifically and others, to help us get through that period. And of course, the team rose to the challenge uh, and got us and got us to the launch pad. And we've managed to fly the spacecraft uh, to a point here where we're just a few weeks away now from from landing. 
I asked the team in the spring of last year uh, to come up with uh, something that would symbolize to mark this, this challenge and to thank in particular the frontline workers, uh, the medical community that were out there doing their job. And the team designed this, uh, we call it our COVID plate. As you can see, uh, it's got a representation of the earth, the globe, uh, all of us facing this challenge together. Uh, it's got a symbol of the spacecraft leaving the earth, heading to Mars, and of course, all of this supported by the familiar staff and serpent of the medical community. We're proudly carrying this plate to Mars so that we'll remember back here on the earth in the year 2020 and 21, uh, that there was a community that stepped up and bravely did their jobs so that we could do ours. I want to uh, pass the baton at this point uh, over to Al Chen. He is our entry, descent, and landing lead. Uh, he's gonna tell you a little bit about this activity that uh, we're gonna go through here in just a few weeks. It's one of the most difficult maneuvers uh, in our business, and he, uh, he will take you through the steps and uh, the challenges that we have coming up in just a few weeks. Al. Thanks, Matt. I don't think I'm exaggerating uh, when I say that uh, entry, descent, and landing is the most critical and most dangerous part of the mission. Success is never assured, and that's especially true when we're trying to land the biggest, heaviest, and most complicated rover we've ever built to the most dangerous site we've ever attempted to land at. If you take a look at this uh, next little video here, you'll get a little taste of what those seven minutes of entry, descent, and landing will look like in just about three weeks. Just looking at and thinking about uh, landing really gets the blood flowing for me. Uh, landing on Mars is really all about finding a place, a way to stop, and uh, stop in a safe place. Perseverance first hits the atmosphere, uh, going almost 12,000, a little over 12,000 miles per hour, and streaks across the sky like a meteor, using that atmosphere to slow down. During that entry, it's got to survive the intense heating and deceleration of that period, while also using thrusters to steer toward the landing target to make sure we go to the right place. After slowing down to supersonic speeds, Perseverance will deploy a large 70-foot diameter parachute while still traveling almost twice the speed of sound. That'll slow the spacecraft down even further. While coming down on the parachute, Perseverance needs to figure out where it is. To do that, it'll jettison the heat shield that protected us during entry, um, and it'll use a radar and a new system we call terrain relative navigation to help figure out where it is. But the parachute alone isn't enough to slow down Perseverance for landing. In fact, the spacecraft is still going more than 160 miles per hour when the parachute is done, slowing it down. That's about as fast as a skydiver would be going if he jumped out of a plane here on Earth and headed straight for the ground head down without a parachute. So at an altitude of a little over